Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. song for you all. Hope you like it. You ready guys? Three, two, one. Lead me Jesus, I will follow down the dusty pathway all along the sea. Teach me Jesus to be loving your 
disciple I will be. Open my eyes that I may see. I will serve you, your disciple I will be. Lead me, Jesus, I will follow. Good morning, Springfield Baptist Church family and other friends and guests who have been able to join with us today. We're glad that you're here with us, and it's great to be able to come together to take time and to worship the one who loves us and made us, even though our connection is over the internet rather than face-to-face -face right now. Uh, today our plan had been to have Dr. Earl Cooper with us. We've supported his ministry work for a number of years. Uh, he works with Across Borders for World Evangelism, and uh, he was in pastoral ministry for a number of years, but today he uh, functions as a professor and an educator of pastors and church leaders in various countries in Africa and in India and other parts of the world, and he is a developer, with that a developer of biblical and theological curriculum in order to instruct church leaders and pastors so that they can work effectively in their home countries. Of course, Earl can't be with us to visit us today in person, but later on he's going to be coming to us by means of a short video segment. So I'm only going to be speaking briefly today. Um, by the way, kids, I hope that uh, you've had the opportunity to enjoy some of our devotionals over the course of the week and that you received some of the handouts that were sent out. Uh, do you call them handouts? I'm not sure. But some of the things that were sent out by the Children's Ministry Committee, the, uh, the coloring pages and, uh, and activity pages that they sent out to you, I hope you got those and have been able to use them. But today we're continuing in the Gospel of Luke. And uh, we're going to be looking at a story that many of you already are quite familiar with. But I'd like to draw out the key truths that Dr. Luke wants us to understand as the Spirit of God guided him in his record of the incident. So let's take a moment. We're going to have a word of prayer, and then we'll look into the Word. Father, we thank you for allowing us to come to your truth, and I pray that you would teach us from it. We know that uh, every time we come, your spirit is able to work and to bring us uh, truths and, and principles and implications that matter for our lives, that matter for lives of people around the world and through all time. And we thank you for the wonder of your word, that it is timeless, that it teaches us and that it shows us Jesus Christ and shows us you with a clarity that we can't find anywhere else. I ask that you'd help us to learn as we look into it now. May we listen carefully, not only with our ears, but with our hearts. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're looking in Luke 9, and it says this beginning at verse 10. On their return, the apostles told him all that they had done. And he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds learned it, they followed him. And he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came to him and said to him, Send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions, for we are here in a desolate place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. They said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we're to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, Have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so, and had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up, twelve baskets, of broken pieces. 
there is a, a record of this particular miracle in all four Gospels, and that's part of the reason why we're so familiar with it. Luke's account is interesting because it's very short and to the point. In fact, it's the shortest of all of the records that we have of this particular miracle. The apostles have all returned from the mission that Jesus had sent them on. They had been preaching the good news, and Jesus had given them the power to throw demons out of people and to heal the sick. You can imagine that they were excited to report then and tell him all about it. I can understand why. Think, just imagine if for a moment you had been given that kind of power. Sick people come to you and by prayer and by your touch, they walk away completely healed. As the good news is being preached, the King, Jesus, has provided a glimpse a preview of what the kingdom is going to be like, a place where death and sickness will be powerless, where there will be no more sin or sorrow. Now, having reported to him, Jesus and the apostles are together near the town of Bethsaida, and the crowds find out. And so many have come and have gathered to hear him preach, and they're asking him to heal them and perform miracles. Well, we're told that it's a quiet, desolate place, way out in the countryside and the day is getting long and people are hungry and tired and if they had brought any food with them at all it's long since gone so the apostles suggest to jesus we should send the crowd away to the surrounding villages they'll be able to buy food and find a place to sleep for the night now as i mentioned before luke's is the shortest account of this particular incident he doesn't include things that we're very familiar with, like, for instance, the discussion with Philip about how much the food would cost, or the fact that Andrew went and found the little boy with the five loaves and two fish and brought them to Jesus. We don't have any of the extra details in this particular record, because Luke is emphasizing just a couple of key truths, and that's where we're going to focus, particularly on what Luke, Dr. Luke, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is emphasizing for us. First thing I want you to notice is this. Jesus tells the disciples to provide for the crowd, and they can't. So he says this to them, you give them something to eat. They've already said to him, send the crowd away. That's going to be the best thing to do. And Jesus says, you give them something to eat. Now remember, they had just come back from doing miracles and being involved in incredible displays of power. And there was lots of excitement and they were probably overjoyed at the results as they'd seen them. People had turned to follow Jesus and, and the disciples were overjoyed at the part that they had played in this. And that's good. But for them, or for us, what happens in this particular section is a useful reminder. What Jesus does is very important. The great works that they had done had been a part of and are still always sourced in and coming from Jesus Christ. This moment makes that clear. You see, by themselves, what the apostles had to offer was not enough. All they had was five loaves and two fish. That's all they'd been able to dig up, and there was nothing much they could do with that for 5,000 men plus women and children. Well, there's a lesson here for us as we consider this and what Jesus put in front of them that matters on so many levels. For instance, here in Canada or in the United States, far too often, a little bit of what looks like success in ministry or spiritual leadership can go to someone's head. That's a normal, broken human tendency. And the fact is, we see it a lot. It might not be spoken out loud, but we see the signs or maybe even have had the thoughts that go something like this. People are looking up to me. I must be doing pretty well. I like this. We've seen it as we've looked at various ministries throughout our continent. And it gets really, really ugly when we see people puffing themselves up or 
looking to get rich from ministry. In fact, this is one of the biggest accusations cynics often make against churches. And they make the accusation aptly because there are people who take a look and think, I'm doing pretty well at this ministry stuff. And then they end up doing really, really wrong things, like giving themselves enormous salaries and putting themselves on pedestals. Not only is it a place where accusations come against the church by cynics, but this is also a source of disillusionment for people who are very sincere as they are seeking to consider the faith. I had a discussion this past week with one of my daughters about conversations that she's had with friends who are very disillusioned when they see people who are supposed to be ministering and who are using this to enrich themselves and using this in ways that make it all about them rather than about Jesus. God's truth is clear. Ministry leaders are called to be servants and real ministry means people are turning to and becoming followers of Jesus, not followers of us, not followers of some person who's put themselves in a superstar position. Related to this, and at a lower level than that, or at a smaller level than that, maybe you've been given a place of significant influence, either spiritual or otherwise, in someone's life. It can feel pretty good to be turned to for answers and to be looked up to. And having answers and being able to contribute good things to others is itself a good thing. But we know that it's easy to slide into self-importance, to want to be the expert, and to allow it to be about my standing rather than more, rather more than it is about helping. It's clearest in the spiritual realm that what we really have to give that is of genuine value is Jesus Christ and something that resembles the heart of Christ. That's what matters. It's clearest in that realm, but it's true in life as a whole that what we want to share, if we're going to share in any good thing, we must share with the heart of Christ. This is what we're called to, and this is what we have that brings value. There's other areas, other levels on which this particular matter of Jesus being the only one is key. Uh, there's lessons, this lesson matters for parents too, and in matters of parenting. There is neglectful parenting, and we recognize that as a problem right away when we see it. But there's also the kind of parenting that wants to keep a child tightly wrapped and be the provider for all the child's needs and the focus of all the child's love. We used to speak of this as someone refusing to cut the apron strings. I'm guessing that that saying had something to do with busy moms tying toddlers to themselves so that they could keep track of them as they worked. But the phrase itself ended up coming to mean someone who wanted their child to revolve around them all the time. Their child to see them as the sole provider of their needs, the child to see them as the focus of all their love. Let me encourage you as parents to regularly, deliberately teach about and point your child's gaze to Jesus as the true provider for their needs and as the focus of their love. Now, we know as parents that we're called to provide. It's good for children to see this and to learn to gratefully honor it. But we must faithfully explain to them that our provision for them is ultimately the blessing of Christ's provision for them. We must help our kids when they look at us in the best of moments to see past us to the source of all provision for them. That's why things like meaningful prayers before meals are an important teaching time in the home. I have heard of families who claim Christ and who don't pray before meals. I believe that that's enormously careless. It's a squandering of a teaching opportunity, an opportunity to continually 
bring children back to the understanding that Jesus Christ is the source of all of our provision and we are continually grateful to him for that. On another note, we love our kids and we want them to love us too. And that's a good thing. But it's a great priority in families as we love our kids that they understand that this love comes from God. That too is something that we want to teach as we help them understand provision is always from God. Provision is always through Jesus Christ. And so, at our tenderest moments together with our kids, moments when their hearts are most open, deliberately, you and I must help our children to see past us to who actually is the source of the love that they experience. Yes, we love them, but love comes from God. And ultimately, ultimately, we must be ready to explain to them that as deeply as we love them, it's only a tiny amount of love compared to the love of their Heavenly Father. When we teach our kids this, we are helping them to understand Jesus as the source of all provision. God as the one who is the beginning of love and is the source of all love. There's a second truth that Luke wants us to take away from this as we see the helplessness of the disciples and the provision of Christ. The second truth that we take from away from this comes in these words. It says, Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples who sat before the crowd, to set before the crowd, and they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up, twelve baskets of broken pieces. The second truth that we take away from this is that they ate and were satisfied and there was lots left over. Now this builds from our first. As we looked at the first truth, we considered Jesus as the one who is actually the source of of provision. As our provision and provider, the second thing for us to understand is that Jesus satisfies. He is enough. That's why he reminds the apostles and us to look to him. His intent is not that we should be left hungering, but that we should be satisfied by and satisfied in him. Now, you know, of course, that I'm not talking about the false teaching floating around today that we call the prosperity gospel. That's a message that teaches people to pretend that they love Jesus when their real intent is to make a bargain. I'll follow him because he gives me the stuff that I really want. And that's not a new way of thinking. In fact, John's account of this particular event of the feeding of the 5,000 shows that after this meal, more people came to Jesus, hoping that he'd put a spread on for them too. And then they left when he didn't. Because really, they weren't there for Jesus. They were there for the food. But here, the Spirit of God has Dr. Luke use physical provision to explain to us that in Jesus, we will be satisfied. We will find enough. There are plenty of times when we're going to come to forks in the road, points of decision. And we might see that if we follow one path and one way of living, we'll get lots of something that we find attractive. Money, stuff, the approval of others, even just getting our own way in a particular circumstance. And we'll see that the other path leads toward Jesus. It involves following Jesus and choosing to live like Jesus and to draw closer to the heart of Jesus. We are told here as people stayed with Jesus instead of going to the villages and instead of looking elsewhere, that Jesus was enough and that he satisfied them. Matthew 6.33 says it this way. It says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of the rest will be added unto you. In other words, make the kingdom and the king your priority. You do that and everything else will be okay. Now, this isn't in opposition to scriptural teaching that we should work hard and provide for our families. It's simply the recognition that Christ is our first priority. 
Hebrews tells us that real faith is believing that not only does God exist, but also that his reward is more satisfying than other reward. It says that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so Jesus says in John, I have come so that you might have life and that you might have it in abundance. And as we take a look at what Dr. Luke has to say here, this is what we find. He alone is where we're going to find contentment. He alone is our source of provision and satisfaction. We must know this ourselves, and we must teach this and display this to anybody that we have influence over, to the kids whose lives that we're involved in, to the people that we might mentor, to the people that we might lead. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for allowing us to be reminded in Jesus' action here that he alone is the source of our provision, that all good comes from you. You are the Father of lights. Every good gift comes from above, and there's no variableness or shadow of turning in you. Lord, we know that you are generous to us, and that you are the giver of good gifts, and that in Christ we have the gift of abundant life. I pray that we would be people who recognize always that you are the source of our provision. Keep us from being able to fall into thinking that somehow it's of us, it's of our doing. May we recognize it's of you. And I pray that when we have the opportunity, may we always point past ourselves to your Son, the one who has provided us with every good thing. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your provision for us, both in this life and in eternity. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it was good to be with you, and I hope you enjoy both the music and the opportunity to hear from Dr. Cooper in just a minute. Bye. Good morning, SBC family. It's good to be with you. Uh, we miss you all. I'm going to share a song this morning with you that reminds each one of us that God is God, that He is sovereign over all things, even when times are bad, even when times are not ideal, that He is on His throne and that He is God alone.
unchangeable, unshakable, unstoppable, that's what you are. Good day to my brothers and sisters in Christ. In the present pandemic context of having to cancel all our travel ministry, one of our supporting church pastors requested a brief devotional thought. Psalm 107 came to mind, and I was encouraged to pass the devotional along. In Psalm 107, we find God's direction in distress. This brief devotional is only a sketch of God's truth. I encourage you to personally study the psalm and discover for yourself its gems of truth. Verse 1 gives us the theme or underlying path of direction. It says in Psalm 107 verse 1, O give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. The word mercy here refers to God's loyal love, His unfailing kindness and devotion. It suggests to us God's love that is steadfast, based on a personal relationship with Him. This psalm shares four threatening situations with different causes and consequences. First, it says in verse 4, They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. We find here a people in a place of vulnerability and danger. In the Old Testament context, the worst place to be is in the wilderness, meaning a place of desolation where there is no population, and away from a city with walls and people that can defend themselves. We find here a place of isolation without direction, with no way of guidance from God. And the psalmist goes on to say in verse 6, these people they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them out of their distresses. The Lord delivers those who call upon Him. Secondly, the psalmist goes on to speak of a people in verse 10 and 11, who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, bound in affliction and irons, because they rebelled against the words of God. Here we find a people in a state of defiance against God's authority. A people that would not acknowledge the sovereignty of God in their own lives. Who felt that the only uh, true existence was a self-existence without acknowledging God's uh, care and God's authority in their lives. This is a people, it says, facing destitution without illumination. Again. They had no direction from God, but here in this situation, they had perhaps the opportunity, but rejected the Word of God as a direction in their lives. Once again, the psalmist says, a people here cried to the Lord, it says in verse 13. They cried to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them from their distress. Thirdly, the psalmist speaks of fools. It says in verse 17, Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Here we see a people callous toward God, disobedient and wicked in conduct. This is a people facing affliction without reflection. In their own knowledge of God, they totally disregarded uh, their conduct before Him. They had no concerns about wickedness in their lives so offensive to God. And again, we see in verse 19, in this situation, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He saved them out of their distresses. The Lord worked in their lives. 
he, he brought a discipline, he brought uh, discomfort, he brought affliction, clearly it states. And yet when they cried, he, the Lord God, in his love, was faithful to deliver them. Fourthly, in verse 23, the psalmist speaks of those, it says, who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on the great waters. And as the text goes on in verse 25, they encounter the stormy wind which lifts up the waves of the sea. And it goes on to describe a severe storm in which these people were in impending danger and destruction. And uh, in the context, because it says that they had no courage and no wisdom to uh, bring about their own deliverance, they were a people facing desperation without solution. A hopeless situation brought about not by any choices of their own, just by the circumstances of life that God brought into uh, their own path. Once again, we come to verse 28, for in that situation, we read verse 28, they cry out to the Lord in their trouble, and He brings them out of their distresses. Once again, we see the loving kindness of God reaching out to those who cry for His help in this kind of a situation. From verse 33 to 42, the psalmist summarizes the issues uh, that people face. We see that in these verses, there is no one that escapes God's dealing. He curses the wicked. He cares for the hungry. He pours contempt on princes. He sets the poor on high. And he says, the righteous see it and rejoice. And this is the focus of what this psalm is all about. And the psalmist concludes it again with these words in verse 43 where it says, Whosoever is wise will observe these things, and they will understand the loving kindness of the Lord. Once again, we fall back to uh, that passage in verse 1, where uh, God's loving kindness, uh, God's mercy, God's love, God's grace, is the underlying path of uh, the direction that God gives us in distress. You see, God's love never fails. He always delivers His children when they cry for help, whether rescuing them from distress or delivering them into His presence. In the world's present distress, let all who have found Christ as personal Savior hold to this promise of God repeated six times in Scripture. I will never leave you nor forsake you. May God bless you with these words from the psalmist in Psalm 107.